Well, welcome back YouTubers. And today I'm gonna to teach you the three fundamentals of tuning your carburetor. It's actually as simple as one, two, three. Not really, but if you break it apart into three different tuning scenarios, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. Your plugs are gonna look better and your car is just gonna run excellent in all conditions. And today, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so before we continue, um, this is how I have my current um, carb over here that's behind it set up. We're gonna, we'll go over a little bit of this, but I have a whole video that explains how to uh, square your jetting uh, using just the area and a little bit of math so you can get a good idea if your jetting with the power valve is square from the front to the rear. Now, a lot of guys have jumped down my throat and says, you gotta flow it, of course. I'm not going to argue that. You, the only way to really know how those jets flow for real, because let me show you real quick, because here's a whole bunch of 83 jets that I've acquired throughout the years. And actually, the holes in these are slightly different. They're pretty close, but they're slightly different. And the reason why is because you see this one, this one is a high flowing 83. So it'll actually flow a little more than a regular 83. Now, the only way to know is to actually flow it. But let me tell you what, guys. If you're a DIY guy, you don't have access to a flow bench, I'm not going to build one. This math right down here is just only to get you in the ballpark. You still have to read your plugs. But the whole purpose of this is to give you an idea of how it's set up so you know stuff isn't too far off. Well, I am a DIY guy. I don't have a flow bench. And I'm sure people watching this don't have a flow bench too, but this math is just to get an idea. Let me just throw that out there for people to jump down my throat. So that you know what this is and how you can set yours up, link in the description. Let me show you why I'm doing this to the carburetor, not that one, but to this carburetor right here. I'm going back to gas um, with the S10 for right now. I still have an E85 carburetor. We can still switch back, but for right now, I'm going back to gas because I want to try it with nitrous. And I'm resetting this guy up and the reason I'm resetting it up, here's two power valve restrictions. And you have to have a carburetor that allows you to adjust these to actually adjust these. You can see, look at that one. That's one that I was trying to get good economy at the 85. So I was going down on my main jets in the front and using the power valve mostly for enrichment whenever it needed it. And you can see this one is more the one that I really need for gas. So I'm going back to gas. I had to throw these in there um, because I didn't have any, any of them ordered. So what I'm doing today is I am going to close that gap with gas so I can go up on the main jets and not rely as much on the power valve for enrichment. But there's other things you have to do to lean it out at part throttle so that way your plugs don't come out and look black. And I thought this would be a good time to talk about that in this video. So today we are closing the gap as far as spreads on the jet and relying less on the power valve. So again, I know I sound like a broken record. To understand what I'm doing here, you have to watch my previous video on this math, your power valve restriction channels and all that good stuff. But as far as it's set up right now, I have 89 jets, which is 104 thousandths on the diameter. And we have on the front, I have a, it's a 90 jet, sorry, 81 jet, which is 90 on the diameter and you can see when you add up the power valve restriction and the rear using that math in the video that i have in the link description you guys better go to that first it's broken record here just watch that video this is not going to make sense so you can see this right here this is the fueling on the rear this is the fueling with the power valve on the front and you can see that we're pretty darn close but i've closed that gap see i have only an eight spread and before I had a big, big, big spread <laughs> with a huge power valve restriction channel. And it was uh, a great cruising. But what happened was when I was shifting gears, it would go lean for a second, then back to a good enrichment. And the reason why that happens is when you have, let me pull these out. We'll talk about this later on. When, we, when you have a big spread that you have to rely on both of these, here's your power valve, right? 
Vacuum, when you change gears, this will move in some, which will slow down the flow to the jets that are in here. So I'm relying less on this and more on these guys and the first channel, which is your idle channel, which uses your transition slot and the idle screws to do all your cruising. We'll get into this more in a second, but it's important that you understand this right here and this guy right here to understand this video. Okay, so when you start your motor, it's broken in, you get a new carburetor, say it's already broken in and you have everything remotely set up correctly, right? The first thing you need to set up on that carburetor is your idle circuit. Right here, this is your low speed, this is your high speed. So your low speed, see it has its own circuit. This comes down, actually this is how it works. It still comes in through your main jets right here, right? We'll say this side, because it's gonna be right here. Comes in here, it comes over this way, and then it goes up here and then down. Now let me explain why you don't hit these guys right here, because this is important, we do it in order. So this metering block sits like this in there, right? So let me put it right here. And of course you have a main body right here. So fuel comes in your main jet, crosses over, it then comes up here. Now see these blades? These blades directly affect how these two guys are gonna work. So we turn this over. You can see here is your idle. This guy right here, this little hole right here is your idle. And if I were to open this up, look at these slots. See these slots right here? Those are your transition slots. So it's very important that at least on your front, because this is where you do most of your um, cruising, because look at this, it's progressive, see? You're not even touching the rear, see this? So when you come up and then when you crack into it, you're still on your front until here, then your rear open up, see that? So I'm gonna go over this several times just so you guys understand if you didn't get it the first time. But we're also gonna go over this guy right here. Now there's two ways you'll see car builders do this. Remember, I'm not a car builder, I'm just a DIY tuning guy and I've seen all this stuff. And I understand, I have a good understanding of it but I'm not an expert. Hopefully my remedial explanation of all this helps um, you DIY guys. You, your fuel bowls, you have fuel up to here. This, ignore all this, because when you're cruising around, you want to just use your idle and your transition. So here is your idle. So this comes down here and it crosses over and goes to that slot. So if you look, this is your number one of tuning. So if you look right here, what you want, you don't want, see this transition slot? That little slot, I'm gonna show it to you one more time so you guys get it. This guy right here. You want this guy just barely exposed right here. If not, then you're gonna hit your boosters. And your boosters are on this side right here. So what'll happen, you'll notice, if you're barely cracking the throttle, you don't wanna see fuel dribble, dribble, dribble out of here. You do not want that. You don't want fuel to come out of here until it's coming out in a spray pattern. You want that fuel to be atomized. You don't want the drop, 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 because drop and you drop fuel fouls out plugs, and it just does, your motor doesn't like that. It can't burn drippity drop fuel. It has to be atomized fuel, right? So when this is set up right, you do have restrictions right here. Some of them will put the restrictions right here. Let me show you an E85 carburetor, which has the restrictions right here. So this one right here is an E85 metering block, and this is gas. And you can see the main difference, I mean there's more, but the main difference is look how large the main wheel passage is right here compared to gas. Because you need 30% more fuel, so you need to have a larger passageway right here for the fuel to go in. That is the main difference. And you have the emulsion tubes, or the emulsion, these little bleeds right here. This one, has less and they're smaller because you need to have a better signal. Now, I don't pretend to understand exactly how the emulsion works. I know I'm getting a little off topic here, but it's kind of good we, we talk about this. But the emulsion kind of works as, it is, basically, it's just a fancy word that says you're adding air bubbles to your fuel. 
which affects the curve. Uh, these guys right here will be directly affected by these guys right here. So you have your low speed, which is all your idle and your transition slot. And then when you come off of that, it goes to your high speed, which this is the third part of the tuning. So you tune to this first, then you tune to this. And there's your transition you tune that gets in between both of those. Okay, so let's get back to this. Sorry for the ranting. I'm gonna repeat myself a lot in this video just so you guys understand it. So on this one, you'll notice, this is the difference between this meeting block besides being E85, but you can do this on gas too. So if you look right here, there is no restriction in a little jet right here. They put the restriction right here. What you can, it's gonna, as long as restriction's here somewhere, but if we were to um, take these guys out, you'll have a lot fatter idle and you'll have to really monkey with the idle air screw right here and it might be fat when you're kind of coming off or hitting it but just so you know whenever i get a carb that's properly sized for my motor i have never ever even whether it be off the shelf from a builder i've never ever had to mess with uh, these restrictions right here i've always been able to get it right by just messing with the fueling on the idle right here these little screws right here that go in and out and they pull fuel from here to there. So one thing that's important to note, if your transition slots open too much, you're gonna pull too much right here and not enough right here. So let me show that to you one more time so you understand. So you can see this blade is closed and when you open it up, see that slot right there? That slot is your transition slot. So when you're cruising around, you only want so much in your idle so that your idle is nice and happy and as long as everything's set up right with your air bleeds, with this guy right here as it comes open, you are not hitting your boosters at all. You're only running off of these two guys right here. All right, so hopefully that made sense. So let's talk about the air bleeds. Now, your emulsion right here, depending on how many holes are in here, how large it is, is going to affect the signal and how these guys are going to react with change. So from what I understand is, the more, the larger the area of holes right here in your main well, and how many you have open, will directly make these guys be a little more sensitive to change. Like I said, I don't, I don't pretend to understand this completely. Like I said, I've never had to mess with any of this stuff. I've always just been able to mess with these guys and this guy right here and get it right. So let's talk about this one right here. This is your low speed. And of course, you see, it goes right here and it adds air into this or air bubbles. So the more air you add from here to here, the leaner it is going to be just putting around. And you'll also, if you go up larger on your air bleeds, you'll also will have to adjust your enrichment right here on your idle. So you can get away with putting bigger air bleeds here and you don't have to mess with your throttle so much or your blades or your idle right there. There's two ways to do this. And the idea is to get it balanced so that transition slot isn't stupid big. And that when you're coming off that transition, you're, only, you're not hitting these guys right here. You don't want to hit these until you transition over from your idle circuit to your main well right here. And like you see, you have air bleeds right here. Now, the way I understand this, and I've kind of seen this too when I've messed or monkeyed around with these, and they're both the same. The more air you put in here, the leaner this side's gonna be, but this one's slightly different, your high speed. This is when you're all the way open and the signal's super strong right here and you're not pulling that much right here. The signal is now moved to this area of the carburetor and your boosters. So what this happens is the smaller that is will move the fuel curve kind of like this. So your low end has less fuel and the top end has more fuel when this guy is a little bit smaller. And if it's bigger, it'll kind of move it like this. So if, if you get everything set up right and you watch at the very, very end of your run, it starts to go a little bit lean, then you know you need to go a little bit smaller on this guy right here and vice versa. So if it goes fat, you need to go slightly bigger on this. Just do these in one step increments, one or two, because depending on how 
your emulsification is set up, it could be a drastic effect. So I don't want you to hurt anything, but these you have to do with a wide band and you have to just do them very carefully. So just keep that into consideration when you start messing with these. Remember, this is gonna be wide open throttle. This is gonna be part throttle. Okay, so we're still on part one of the tuning. I know this is long, but it's very important you listen to this. So before you go wide open throttle or any of that stuff, if you haven't done this before, I recommend you just put around cruising around and you pull your plugs after a while. If they don't come out looking clean like this, then you have a problem with your idle circuit, not your main jets or anything else. You have a problem with that. Now, your main jets will slightly affect all this because they're all kind of tied in like you see, but I recommend that you mess with this first, your idle and your cruise, before you start monkeying with your main jets. So you want your plugs when you're just cruising around and you're not cracking into it to look like this. And once you have them looking like this, you can now move on to doing some wide open throttle pulls. Okay, so these two plugs came out the back and they are still a little fat, in my opinion. Let me show you what I'm gonna do to correct and how I had it set up. So I always set up most of my idle, majority of it on the rear. So I might be having the transition slot cracked open a little too much in the rear. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to bring that down, but I went ahead and I put 70, this brawler, it's actually a brawler carburetor. So it came with a six, I believe 32 and 73 air bleed. So 32 on the high speed and 73 on low speed. I went 76 here and I went, uh, I didn't have any two sets of 76s, so I went 75 in the rear. So what I'm gonna try is just messing with the air bleeds first to try to get the rear and bring this guy in a little more and open up the front idle a little more. So that way, hopefully the back ones, cause it was the very, very back ones that were getting a little more fat. Cause you know, I was using most of my idle on the rear. So it's gonna go to those plugs first. So I'm gonna try balancing it out a little more and we'll try it again. Okay, so we're cruising around. Our plugs aren't loading up. Everything looks happy. And we are still gonna have to change plugs at the very end and do wide open throttle pulls. But the thing I'm telling you guys, there's different conditions when you pull your plugs. Wide open throttle is its own freaking thing. I'm telling you. So now let's talk about the transition. So like I said before, I'm gonna keep on repeating myself. We have now figured out that we're just kind of putting around. Everything's smooth. We haven't cracked into our secondaries. Our plugs aren't loading up, just putting around. We're sitting at stoplights. We're not smoking, nothing smells stupid. Like I said before, you have to get that part set up first before you move on to the other. And the reason why is because if you do not, it will throw off your other readings. All right, so now that's out of the way, we know we're good. So now we're gonna start getting busy with it, right? So we're gonna just cruise around and see this guy right here? Look at this guy. This is a, isn't this a beautiful carburetor? ATM is like one of the few companies that I I mean, there's, there's more, but ATM, you get an excellent product for the money. I can't tell you guys how hard it is to find something like this for the money. I have done my own things to it, but you would have to pay so much more for a carburetor like this than get it from ATM. Anyways, hey, Doug, hit me up, baby. We need another carburetor. Anyways, all right, so let's get back to it. So you're cruising around, idle, stoplights, and your plugs are coming out looking like this, right? So now it's time to get busy with it and crack into it. So the first thing I want you to do is to just stab at it like this, right? Stab at it. And this is where a wide band is gonna help make your life 10 times freaking easier. Now I want you to watch that wide band. So when you stab at it, you wanna see where the air fill goes. If it goes all down the nine and you feel it kind of load up and then it pulls, that means you need to adjust your accelerator pump timing. Now your accelerator pumps, Here's your um, diaphragm right here. It goes to an arm, and here you got these cams. You have different cams. You have one on the front, and you have one on the back. Now there's two transitions you need to worry about. 
there's a transition in between these two guys. I do have my linkage right here set up pretty close. So you, there's a transition in between this. Let me get the other one so you can see a little better because this is probably how yours is gonna be. Here's your secondaries and here is your primaries. See this right here? You're just cruising around, everything's looking good. And then when you do this, there is a transition. It goes from here to there. There's two transition. There's a transition from your idle circuit in the front right here to your transition slot to your boosters. That's one transition. And there's also a transition to your secondary. See that? And that's where these guys right here and your accelerator pumps and your discharge nozzles are going to smooth that out. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this without a wide band is gonna be very, very tricky to get right. And not only that, but even with the wide band, this is one of the trickiest circuits to get really smooth. Sometimes what'll happen is when you hit it, it'll go like, bam, and I hear it go, Hoo, and then pick up. Usually that means, or it'll pop. If it pops, you know you're, you're definitely too lean. But like I said before, this is why you need a wide band because you can kind of tell at what point you're getting your lean spot, your flat spot, or it's too uh, rich. You want to get it as close to that target 12.5 air fuel with your wide band as possible when you're doing all this. Easier said than done. Now, I always put 50 cc's. The reason why I put 50 cc's in mine is because I have never had good luck with this. I have never had the best luck using just off the shelf cams. I have always, to get it perfect, see this is a 50 cc, and look at this. Let me show you what I did. And I'm still working on my carburetor, by the way. That gas one. So if you look, this is my custom cam I've been grinding. And you gotta be extremely patient to do this. I even put another hole so it kind of moves it up. Some of them you might need to bring it down and bring in the fuel a little smoother or reverse this to bring it in smoother and get more here. It all depends on your intake, your gear, your cam, vehicle weight. So this, I can't give you a any inclination of how you should set it up. You're just gonna have to use a wide band and watch it and try to get that target air fuel when you stab at it to not be super fat like nines or peg lean. You wanna get it in between. If you get it in between like, you know, 11.0 to like, you know, 12.8 range, if you hit like 12s or something when you stab at it and it goes right there to the happy land, uh, you got something going on good because uh, it's all depending on your application and your vehicle. You cannot just say do this or this cam and have that work. Not only that, but there's also different diaphragms that go in here. There's a spring that goes in here and there's different diaphragms. So this is a 30cc diaphragm. You can see a difference in the size of the volume of fuel. Here's a diaphragm that goes in a 50, way more. The blue one is just a little more durable than the black ones. They don't tend to dry out as much. So what happens is when this arm pushes this, you have these cams that will dictate how fast this arm moves. And this guy right here, even bigger than your discharge nozzles, I'll show you, discharge nozzles I've noticed don't do as much as the cams, for sure. The cams and your accelerator pump arm, the way it's set up, there's a whole thing of how to set these up. I'm not gonna go into it right now. I'm just trying to get you guys the overview of this. But this is gonna squirt fuel into your motor because the reason why that's very important, it's very important because the way this works, if you do this really quick, the motor vacuum has to happen in these carburetors, right? So it has to pull the fuel in your bowls to your main jets all the way up and then out your boosters. But when you crack into it, it's way, way, way too fast, right? You'll have a huh, and then it'll pick up. Or it might pop through or backfire. I mean, who knows? It can do all types of bad things if this isn't set up right. So what these guys right here do, and there's different sizes of these guys, these are all discharge nozzles. These are little down leg guys right here. They squirt a little more directly in there. And you have ones that aren't. Honestly, they both work. 
So you have weight, you have different sizes, which have different holes in here, just like jets. And this is just another way to get the correct amount of fuel to your motor when it needs it, only off the hit. If you have anything in your carburetor, or every time you, you stab at the gas, and if it goes, Hoo, or it gets too fat, right, when you stab at it really hard, it's all discharge nozzles, cams, accelerator pumps. This is the most tricky thing these guys, this transition right here, in my experience, is the most tricky thing to set up and it's also crucial. Because a lot of times, people will get those stumbles and all the other crap and they'll mess with their jets or they'll mess with like, you know, uh, their idle air. No, don't do it. This is how you get to the next part, this transition right here. There's also two different screws. You see, this screw is not hollow. This is a low flowing screw. There's a, a certain size on the discharge nozzle. I can't remember offhand uh, which one it is, but you have to, at a certain point, go to a large, this screw with the hollow insert. You see it has like a little hole right there. It's gonna flow a lot more fuel than this guy. So if you put a big old uh, discharge nozzle in with this screw, you're never gonna get the flow to it. You have to at a certain point, which I forget what it is. I just always run these because I'm always running something that's pretty a decent size squirter, but you can just put one of these guys in there and then you don't have to worry about that crossover. So I would definitely just run one of these guys over this little dinky thing right here. Okay, so right here we have a blue cam and a pink cam. And I'm gonna show you the difference. Obviously the pink cam has a more of a gradual slope and the blue cam has a much more aggressive slope, right? So I'm gonna show you how this works right here. First of all, what you need to notice is that they have different holes, especially the pink cam. So which means just you can either put it here or move it upwards, which is going to change your ramp. So keep that in mind when you're tuning your accelerator pump timing. So we're gonna put the pink one in first, and we're just gonna put it in the first hole. So what I want you to look at is the pump arm. I'm gonna do this one first. I'm gonna do it the same speed. All right, do it a couple times, same speed. Now, I'm gonna put the blue one in and we'll put them side by side and we'll see the difference. So let's go one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000. Now we have the blue arm and watch how much with that sharp edge right there, and it being a different angle, watch how quickly this arm comes down. Watch this. So check it out side by side. Look at the blue one, it's coming down faster and it's coming down farther than the pink cam. Let's go to an overlay so you can see it. And here you can see it faster and farther. So you can see how this can drastically affect your transition. Okay, so pretend you spent all weekend dicking around with your accelerator pumps your discharge nozzles, all that stuff, getting a nice smooth transition from your primaries to your secondaries, you're stabbing at it, and the thing's going rah, rah, and it feels like it wants to just take off, right? And the, and the air fuel is anywhere from like, you know, 11.0 off the hit to like 12. Being a little fat's okay, but you don't want it going all the way down in like the nines. And that is something that you cannot read your plugs with, is uh, your transition, your accelerator pumps. You gotta look at your wide band. So you've done that, you're now making full pulls, and say it goes a little bit lean, a little bit rich, like 11, like 11.5. So then you're gonna probably go up around, you know, uh, about three or four sizes up on both sides. I'm uh, sorry, you know, down on both sides. Or if it's too lean, you're gonna go about three or four sizes um, up, depending on how it's acting on your wide band. Remember, the wide band is just a tool. You want to use that to make sure that you're not going to hurt anything. So you want to get it everything in a nice, happy 12.5 AFR range, right? So now that's all feeling good. Uh, you know, it's not pinging. It feels like it's pulling strong. It's not laying over. So now it's time to get a, a couple of sets of plugs. I recommend you get like enough to do like three pulls to get enough plugs for three different pulls, wide open throttle rips. You're gonna use your riding around plugs that you know aren't loading up. You're gonna take that to your test spot, right? Drive it all the way to your test spot. 
Always make sure your motor is good and warm before you make this hit. Shut it down, and as quickly as you can, I know this is a pain in the ass, as quickly as you can, change to new plugs. You don't want to idle it or drive it too far. At the most, you want to go like, you know, maybe like 2,000 yards if you're going into a parking lot, then back to your test spot, and you immediately make a full rip in all your gears. Rah, bah, 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 right? And then we get top of third. If you have an automatic, be sure to slow down to around 40 miles an hour before you kill your motor, else you might hurt some clutches and other stuff in your transmission. If you have a manual, you can probably just kill it right away and just coast over. But if you have an automatic, slow down as quickly as you can, kill it, pull over, then pull all your plugs. So now I'm gonna show you what to look for because we're gonna do some full rips in my vehicle to show you what you need to look for for fueling to make sure everything's okay and it's not gonna hurt it. You do not wanna rely completely on your wideband for this. The wideband is just a tool that you're gonna use to make sure you're not gonna hurt anything, but your plugs are gonna be the tell all, end all, even for your cruising and for your wide open throttle pulls. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of pre-gap plugs. I already have anti-seize on them, so when we get to the spot, I can just throw them in there. I want to show you guys a cold start. This is where a lot of you guys mess up. You'll start it up, and you'll monkey with your idle air when it's still a cold, and say it's good, but when it warms up, it's going to start being pig rich. So I'm going to show you exactly how lean this is when it's cold, but when it warms up, it gets to that optimal air fuel where the plugs aren't doing anything stupid. Remember, it's dead cold, so keep this in mind. Remember, I'm only talking about a race carburetor. I don't care about carburetors with chokes, right? If you have a choke, I don't want to hear it because I don't use them. Here we go. Get a little bit of gas. We're in neutral. Pay attention to this. We've got a warm up on It's going to bring it over here. So we'll give it a second and we'll come back whenever it's warm. Now we got some heat in it and you can see that it's uh, a lot fatter. This is in gear. I'm going to take it out of gear. About 13, 8, 14, and in gear. So we're gonna try that for a little while. Okay, so let's talk about this light throttle condition. Just pulling out from the stop sign right here. Notice it will go a little bit fat, but when you start making your power valves and your front jets, rear jets closer, it kind of does that when you're pulling away from the light. But if you'll notice, as we're cruising, it's gonna go into the 12s, then it'll, and when you get even light throttle, you're just barely touching the gas keep it going in like a all-out cruise condition, you'll notice it'll go into 13s, 14s, and 15s. Now the thing you need to understand, as long as you're not in power or loading the motor, having it lean is not a problem. As long as it's not surging or like, you know, bucking, like it's having the stress, like it really wants more fuel when it starts to get lean, you really don't have to worry about hurting anything at just very light cruising conditions. It's only when you're on the motor and you have a load on it that you don't want to go lean because when it's lean on a load, that's when you start hurting things. But as far as cruising, having it nice and lean, long as it's not bucking, you know, surging, you're probably most likely gonna be fine, but you're still gonna have to pull the plugs after a while and read them to see how it's all acting. Okay, so put new plugs in. We're at the test spot. It's kind of busy down the road. I cracked one of the old ones. Uh, pulling it out, that's okay. I got extra just in case that happened. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a hit and then we're gonna come back, pull them out, go to the house and we'll look at them. We'll cut the threads off and all that good stuff to see how the fuel ring looks. So let's do it.
lost a little bit of traction there. I didn't even try to get first gear because that was going to be ridiculous. All right, look at these plugs. All right, let's talk about this full rip. I started out in the second gear and I tried to put it as long as low as I possibly could. So I'm going to stab at it. You'll watch it go fat for a quick second. But that was all accelerator pump that's doing that. Had to pedal it. See, I pedal it a little fat in the 10s, back to 12s. So we pull it through 12, 12, 2, then a shift. It's gonna go like 13.0, then back to like 12, 12.6, 12.3, 12.4, 12.3, 12.4, 12.4, 12.6, 12.5, all the way up to the top of 7,000 in third gear. So that's not too bad. We got a good, even, consistent air, air fuel. I'm gonna slow down here. This is an automatic transmission. You don't wanna kill that thing at like, you know, 127 miles an hour. You want to slow down as quick as you can, get around 40, then you'll see I'm killing it now, and I'm going to pull over to a safe spot. So, I, in my opinion, that pedaling it, I wasn't really in it as long as I needed to be, so I didn't think that this read was going to be perfect, but we'll take these plugs back, we'll look at them, and we'll see what we got. We're going to look at these better. Man, I've got to stop doing this always cracking one of the porcelains ah like a rookie over here but i think it's just good when you use this long ass thing i use this on number one it's just easy to torque it this way or that way but so far we're looking pretty good we gotta cut the threads off and look at the fueling ring in there next i gotta wait a second um to get to those last two i've already freaking burned myself trying to get to them i just don't want him to come up here and start yelling at me i mean you already got this right here look check it out <laughs> no warning shots. Hopefully they're uh, okay with me just being right here and being America. That's kind of America too. So we are just going to let that cool off. I'm gonna throw the driving plugs back in, take this back to the house and we will examine it. Freaking forgot my Sharpie. So I had to do this. This is uh, uh, one, three, five, seven. This is two, four, six, eight. So I'm gonna drive nice and slow. Usher baby. All right, so I kind of screwed this one up. I used a cutoff wheel and it slipped and I kind of cut all into that. So I'm not sure what this side looks like, but you can definitely see a little bit of a fuel ring right there. See this colorization? So if you look, it'll be easier to see another one, but if you look right here, there's like a little discolorization right here where it gets darker right there at the base. Now at first thought, you might say it's be too lean, but I really wasn't in it very long. And it's really important that you do a full pull in first, second, and third. I tried my best in second gear to get the hook. And I still had to pedal it. And I took it to the top of third, which is about 127, you know, 28, 29 miles an hour. So that's, that's all we can do with that little steep gear I have. But I did my best to keep it in you know, power as long as possible and then cut it down. But um, there's something else you need to look at. Uh, this might, to some, look too lean. But I want you to see this. So here is, make sure we get a focus on this. And you can see the time and mark, which is time and mark, which is right here, which that's perfectly safe. There was no speckling on the porcelain, no signs of heat. But if you look at this, if I turn it to the side, if you look right there, see that discolorization? We're not even down into the first thread. As this cadmium, see right here, see that cadmium right there? We didn't even burn off. All the cadmium. So I really didn't have enough heat in the motor or have it or have it, you know, in power long enough. Now I could possibly maybe go up and give a little more timing and see what happens. But this right here, nothing really concerns me. And it's this is kind of like reading plugs is definitely an art. I'm not saying I'm the best, like I said before, but I've talked to people and who are way better than I am, and they've taught me all this. So, and I have a little bit of experience by being on the dyno, we're seeing this. If I were to make another hit, I guarantee you it'd have more heat and it would be down instead of thread. But that's what we got to go off of. I don't see anything too bad in number one. So let's go to number two. Here is a number two, and you can still see a faint fuel ring all the way around. Because if you look right here, it's definitely, you can see it right here. Hopefully it shows up on camera. It goes all the way around. Now, nitrous, I would definitely want to be a little fatter just to be safe. But if you look at this guy right here, 
you can see it has a good bit of acetyl shininess, still has a good bit of cadmium, and the more you burn off all the way around, it's going to give you more heat. And of course, if you turn it sideways, you can see that we're still not getting heat. So that discolorization right there, we're still not getting heat into any of these threads. So I don't really want to make any changes based off of this. I really need to like get it and make a longer hit or take it to the dyno to really figure out what's going on because I could basically be chasing myself in circles. But right now I want to look at all these plugs and see how the fueling is, make sure they all look pretty similar. So here we have number four and it definitely looks like it has more of a fuel ring. And it also looks like it had a more heat in it. So imagine that, right? Time and mark still looks good. Time and mark is right here. So the timing is probably a little less retarded, a little more retarded on that one, which might be the reason why it has more fuel, or it might just have more fuel in the intake right there. Still doesn't have much heat. See, we're still not even into the second ring yet. Second thread, sorry, on that guy. Let's go to the next one. Here we have six. Looks pretty similar to the others. No speckles on the porcelain. Still looks like it has about the same heat in it. Timing looks to be right around here. See that? Right around there. Pretty much the same spot the other one. So, so far we're looking pretty good and pretty even. Here we have eight. Yeah, I messed up again with the, with the uh, cutoff wheel or the grinder. Still looks, uh, let me make sure I'm focused. Still looks about the same as the other ones. Let's look at this guy right here. You can see that cadmium right there. See that little shininess right there? The cadmium's not burnt off, so it didn't really have a lot of heat in it. Nothing looks like it's distressed. Same timing mark right there. You can see it's right there. So let's go on to go one, three. Here's number three. Three, you know, it looks about the same with all the other ones. Slight fuel ring, not that much. Time marks super easy to see. You can see a lot more cadmium on that one. See that shininess right there? Five. Here's five. This looks like this fuel ring might be slightly easier to see. I can see it pretty good off camera. Hopefully you guys can see it, but it's, you can see, then you can see the difference as it goes up. See that? Time and mark, exact same spot. Heat. Oh, look, we barely touched that thread right there in this one. So we had a little more heat in that one. I better keep an eye on a number five when we start spraying nitrous. And then we have seven. It looks like it has a little more fuel than all the other ones. See this right here? This is a 4.7 swap cam, so that makes sense to move it around. Don't see any speckling. Look at this. Still see a little cadmium that's not burned off right there. And time and mark. Uh, that's a bad side. Right there, you can see it. It's right around here. Same, same spot as the other ones. And the heat. Uh, we got a little bit of heat into the first thread. So, all together, not bad. I'm not mad at any of this. Well, we have made it to the end of the video. Now, I still have a little bit of monkeying I need to do with the accelerator pumps and the discharge nozzles to get this thing dialed in just a little bit better. But we made it to the end, so hopefully this video, I know it was long, will help you guys to dial in your Holly or whatever carburetor you have, that's a 4150, to get it running great on the street and great at the track. Until next time, don't forget to subscribe and peace.